Yes, a very good morning once again and many thanks for staying with us right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Romeo Busuku and of course I come to you yet again with another pertinent con conversation, largely focusing on world wildlife conservation in that regard. Tomorrow is World Wildlife Day and we are celebrating that day in advance on the 2nd of March. Well, tomorrow we shall be raising awareness on the benefits of protecting our wild species and their habitats in that regard. The theme shall shall be, yes, restoring key species for the full, you know, restoration of the ecosystem in that regard. But for now, we are going to be uh, breaking down some of the nitty-gritty, some of the challenges, the successes that have been uh, registered right here in Uganda when it comes to wildlife conservation. All right, ahead of the Wild Wildlife Day tomorrow, let's have a conversation today in anticipation of the same. I do have the Honorable Minister of State for Tourism, Antiquities and uh, Wildlife, and that is Honorable Bahindu. Martin Mugara, he's with us right here. We also do have a representative from the EU, the European Union, and that is none other than Nadia Kanata. She is the first secretary, sustainable development section in that regard. We also do have Tom Sengalama. He is a team leader, nature, climate, energy, and resilience at the United Nations Development Program. Thank you, gentlemen and lady, for joining us right here on Interview Uganda. Thank you. And of course, let me start with the Honorable Minister of State of Tourism. Um, let's kick off with the easiest question of all. World Wildlife Day. What does it mean for the world and Uganda alike? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's not only celebrated mm. in Uganda alone. Mm. It is uh, celebrated uh, all over the world. Indeed. And I want to thank uh, the entire international community that saw it important mm. to discuss uh, conservation, especially mm. in terms of uh, issues we've been having with the endangered species Indeed. and the rest. And I think that's why the theme is mainly looking at how we, we regrow mm. or protect uh, the endangered species uh, going forward. But I want to start by thanking the, the development partners because without them, this wouldn't have been possible. Because mm. they've been with us all the all the way from the beginning, and as you know, this day was declared by the uh, United Nations mm. about around uh, 2013, and uh, we've been celebrating it since then, uh, since the year 2014 as a country. Mm. So I think uh, tomorrow will be the ninth time we are we are celebrating it. Mm. We've been doing it regionally as well to create awareness, not only in Kampala but even outside, about the importance of conservation uh, and the rest. So I think it's very important that people get to know and understand uh, the importance of uh, wildlife, uh, the importance of conservation, uh, conserving the environment as well. So I think it's important and I hope it creates more awareness out there as to why we think conservation mm. is key. And I think as we go on, we shall uh, break down uh, on the number of Is the issues. message really reaching home, Honorable Minister? Because we are getting information that many people are still, you know, uh, pretty much engaged in deforestation. They are actually destroying the habitats of these wild species. So restoration of the ecosystem will be far-fetched if we do not stop these practices why do they continue happening is it because of poor awareness raising information proliferation being too low among the communities mm. well I would say first of all government has taken a number of measures mm. uh, for instance in terms of conservation because it, both go hand in hand indeed conservation with the with the, with the wildlife mm. uh, for instance if you look at the um, uh, at the amended the 2019 wildlife act indeed. that puts a stringent uh, uh, you know uh, punishments or for, for people that engage in poaching, mm -hmm. that engage in uh, wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife trade. That, in, For instance, uh, if you look at the Wildlife Act today, we don't even have room for, for, for creating, beca because you know before, uh, some, something would go before parliament and then they would be allowed to degazette part of mm -hmm. the protected areas. Now the law does not create any room for degazation anymore. So, so, so at least government has put in place measures through, through uh, these enactments that at least now curtail any other encroachment onto most of these protected areas mm. but the challenges are still there and uh, of course we shall keep doing what we can uh, the awareness doesn't stop we still have issues to do with poaching mm. we have uh, all these indigenous species and it's not only a Ugandan problem mm. it's an international problem mm. and that's why uh, we, we are happy that with all our partners that we have uh, a, a, an integrated approach all over the world to see how we how we stop this mm. because if someone went for instance to one of our parks and uh, probably killed an elephant and wanted to to, to trade in, uh, in ivory. Mm. So at least because of the engagement of the entire international community, you can have the ivory here, but trading it maybe to the destination market in China would be mm. a problem. Mm. So it's been a number of legislation across the world to make it uh, very difficult for whoever 
uh, participates mm. in endangering uh, this wildlife. Mm. So we, we, we still believe that the challenges are there. We have human wildlife conflict. We also, the wildlife gets out of the parks and destroys uh, communities. Indeed. And communities also now do revenge. They get to the parks, like, like what you saw when they poisoned, uh, you can imagine, around nine lions in Queen Elizabeth Indeed. By, by the cattle keepers because the lions went outside, you know, killed uh, just one cow and someone puts poison in the carcass and he kills all this. Mm. So, so we are trying to create an environment where we all mutually coexist, amongst the communities and even the wildlife. Mm. And, and, and uh, we, we have a deliberate program as government uh, to do with the uh, revenue sharing, where 20% of all the revenues out of park entries <coughs> go to these communities. And it's a significant amount of money, because some districts, for instance, uh, and, and we've done it deliberately now that the money should go to only the parishes that neighbor the parks. For instance, you'll find a community uh, where only four parishes, let's say, touch the park, and they're getting around 1 billion, 1.5, and mm -hmm. we're trying to give them advice to see how best they can do projects that help uh, the community get better and maybe um, grow in terms of income. Mm. So, so we are doing what we can uh, to see that we coexist, but also create awareness. A and I want to mm. thank uh, uh, the Uganda Wildlife Education Center. Uh, if I gave you the figures, for instance, you'll be shocked. Uh, if mm. you think there is not much awareness, just to give you for, for, for December alone, uh, WEC had the number of around 17,000 visitors from just 25th December to the 1st of January this year. 17,000 visitors, 90% Ugandans, that went and got education about, about conservation, about loving wildlife. So Ugandans are participating more and they're getting the message. Mm. And, and of course the deliberate effort is that once we instill this message to these people, especially at a younger age, mm. then definitely they'll grow up knowing uh, mm. uh, the importance of all this. So, so we, are, we, we are doing what we can, still with the development partners, and we thank them, because without this, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be possible. Mm. But also the entire, the entire globe. Indeed. Those that have wildlife and those that don't. Mm. To see how we deliberately move together and put an end mm. to, to, to endangering uh, wildlife. That is the Minister of State for Tourism, Antiquities and Wildlife, Mr. Bahindika Martin. Thank you for joining us right here on NTV Uganda. On the 28th of February, um, your boss, that is the uh, Minister of Tourism, Tom Butimi, he did come out and he did say that uh, there is a dwindling a number of crested cranes within our country. They are endangered as we speak. Are there any other endangered species moving forward besides uh, the crested crane? A number of them, mm -hmm. Al almost Mister. actually, we would say, right from the showbill stock, from the chimpanzees, mm -hmm. from the elephants, from the lions. We have we have uh, low populations mm -hmm. now. To the, most of these animals, to the pangolins. Mm -hmm. So, so for us, actually, would say that almost all all the wildlife is endangered. Mm -hmm. Because if 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 you go to most of the areas in Uganda, mo most of our local population actually eat most of these animals. I, I mean. Uh, so, 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 so a number of them, but we are saying that the most targeted, uh, mainly that we look at conserving mm. the most are the chimpanzees, are the, are the, are the pangolins, are the lions, uh, the elephants especially, the rhino is, mm. is, is, is a highly endangered species, especially in Uganda. Mm. So, so, but, but we are doing a deliberate uh, efforts to see that uh, we conserve so that, and actually even restocking, mm. like, like uh, what we are trying to do with the, with the Ziwa rhino sanctuary, mm. to make sure that we bring back the rhino species back into the country. Mm. So, so we are doing uh, something deliberate to see that at least we get these stocks back. Mm. But of course, that's why I was saying that we cannot do this alone. Mm. We should do it with the support of the communities, that they should understand the message of uh, why we are doing uh, uh, conservation, mm. why we are, we are saying the environment is key. <coughs> usually, I, usu I usually say uh, sometimes that, especially when we engage with the communities, mm. and last year alone we moved uh, across the country trying to create awareness among these communities neighboring mm. most of these protected areas mm. all over the country and talking to them and trying to engage the leaderships. But, uh, and we usually tell them, but you see, if, mm. even since most of us are Christians, that even during creation, mm. when God uh, uh, in Genesis, you, you know, he created man and said, I'm, I'm giving you responsibility over all this nature. And the wildlife was part of it. Mm. So it would be very shameful of us to surrender now. Let's say if he came back, uh, like we all believe that he will, and then you only found human beings in the world, and, 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 and the wildlife is not mm. there. I think it would be. Thank so it's responsibility to us as Christians, especially as a Ugandan, whether Christian or Muslim, first of all, to, to fulfill that uh, Christian uh, responsibility hmm. of taking care of wildlife. Uh,
for purposes of clarity, Honorable Minister Bahinduka, break down some of the factors leading to the extinction of these uh, wild species, especially the crested crane. Wetland degradation was actually highlighted at some point, poor agricultural practices. Mm. You also mentioned poaching. What are the other factors embedded? Uh, of mm. course, now the biggest is really demand uh, for, for land because you see the population is growing. I see. And, and people keep thinking that, and we've said because already most of these protected areas have been encroached on enough uh, over the years. Indeed. And we keep telling them that even if you encroached the entire protected area, land will never be enough. Try to find a way of living within uh, what we have and be productive. Mm. Otherwise, so, so the biggest push is the population growth. Therefore, demand for agricultural uh, land. Mm. That's why you see uh, most of the, of the swamps. Uh, being encroached on, there's a lot of deforestation because of uh, that 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 pressure from uh, the population growth. Mm. So, so that's why you keep saying that awareness is key. I know finally we shall get there, and of course, uh, most importantly also, because you see the political class and the leadership is so important in this mm. to bring them on board to understand, because it, it's it's. I, uh, going forward, you wouldn't believe that even up to today someone would be, you know, putting up a fight, especially on the floor of parliament. For degradation, I think mm. it doesn't make sense with, with, with global warming today. I, I think going forward as a country, uh, Uganda, of course, that we call the Pearl of Africa, for those particular reasons, we shall, this will bring, first of all, it mm. brings in a lot of money. If I just told you how much money we get out of tourism, mm. 1.6 billion uh, US dollars, it's the biggest foreign exchange bringer in this country, employing over 6-7% of the entire employment population mm -hmm. in this country. So, so it's a key sector. Conservation is so important for, for, for our souls, for the generations to come. Because even if we encroach, for instance, uh, on most of these uh, forests and, and, and the rest, because first of all, they bring in the rain and the rest, they keep at least, they balance the environment and the entire ecosystem. Mm. Then even agriculture will not be successful. So when you degrade the whole area, you will not be able to plant tomorrow because you won't mm. be able to get rains. Mm. So, so you can see the, 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 the connection among us the, mm. the, the whole strategy. Mm. So, 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 but the biggest problem, really, is the growth in population. I but I know so many communities across the world that have been able to live within, uh, within uh, these small areas and survived and have become more productive. Mm. But I want to thank government, and uh, most especially His Excellency, the President, because he has made it clear. There is no argument that you'd put before him that says, you know what, let's think twice about uh, maybe getting into a protected area and creating land for community. Mm. I think the deliberate move now is even those that are living in the protected areas, we should get money uh, for them, mm. get them compensation and have mm. them relocated out of, uh, out of, of, of this protected area. Honorable Bahinduka, thank you so much for that humble preamble. We shall get back to you when it comes to what your ministry is doing to address the challenges you just highlighted for us. Mm. Let me get to Tom Sengalema. He's representing the United Nations Development Program. Now, let's talk about uh, the significance of World Wildlife Day in the Ugandan context. Why is it so significant for my people right here in this country to celebrate or observe this day? Hmm. Yeah, thank you, moderator. World Wildlife, World Wildlife Day hmm. is significant for a number of reasons. Hmm. One, man is part of biodiversity. Indeed. And therefore, man cannot live without biodiversity. We have seen that because of the pressures that the minister has raised, mm. we are seeing rapid degradation of key biodiversity areas. The wetlands mm. being encroached on, the forests being destroyed for charcoal, for building materials, mm. for fuel wood, but also the expansion of agricultural land in marginal areas. Indeed. As a result of that, we are seeing conflicts between humans and wildlife struggling for survival. Mm. Now, the purpose of World Wildlife Day is to raise the awareness about the importance of that, in, uh, that relationship mm. between man and nature and to raise the attention on the dangers that are facing wildlife mm. and to ask for both political and civil action to protect wildlife. Are we registering any successes in that sphere? The animals living harmoniously with the people around them? I think what UNDP has done right mm. from the beginning was to recognize the fact that wildlife cannot thrive mm. when people and wildlife are not brought together, when there is no, uh, I mean, there is no coexistence. coexistence. And in order to promote this coexistence, 
you need to address the livelihood needs of the communities, but also you need to create opportunities for people to benefit mm. from the existence of wildlife. And one of the ways is mm. the benefit from the ecosystem services that wildlife generate. One of them is mm. tourism. Mm. And what we have done is to work with the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, work with the Uganda Tourism Board, mm. work with UWA, to identify those incentives, mm. uh, finance them, build the capacity of communities and wildlife actors, mm. and then have that relationship strengthened. We have seen conservation enterprises. Mm. We have built capacity of rangers and, um, and uh, tour guides mm. to enable them effectively participate in tourism business. In that way, uh, communities are able to appreciate the economic impact of wildlife and support its conservation. Mm. So yes, we have seen positives. For instance, we have seen mountain gorillas population raising. We have seen number of elephants increasing. Mm. Actually, Uganda registered, was recognized for increasing, for the increased population of, of elephants mm. in, in this region. Mm. So yes, there are positives, but we need to do more. Hmm. We need to address the issues of wetland degradation, and the UNDP is working in 24 districts hmm. now, working with the Minister of Water and Environment, working with the Minister of Agriculture, working with the Uganda Meteorological Authority hmm. to restore wetlands in 24 districts, Indeed. and also restore livelihoods of communities who have depended on these wetlands. So with those initiatives, we shall see increased appreciation and positive coexistence mm. between nature and humans. And, and of course, Tom Sengalama, the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us something. Mm. The coronavirus is still pretty much still here with us. Whenever people interact with the animals and they destroy their habitats, they're actually exposing the people right here on the earth to more vulnerabilities or health shocks. There are over a hundred coronaviruses residing within the wild species out there. So when you um, encroach on these habitats, you force these animals out, they're going to go back into the communities and they're going to spread these coronaviruses a hundred plus and counting. Mm. Let's talk to us about um, uh, the <laughs> and how it affects the people within the world. Mm. Yeah, actually, coronavirus has taught us that man cannot survive without biodiversity. Mm. Because what biodiversity does, it creates that balanced relationship that neutralizes some of these problems mm. and builds resilience within communities and within ecosystems. I think what coronavirus has taught mm. us is that we need to carefully plan our land use and ensure that wildlife is given its space, mm. but also ensure that communities and, um, and, oh, and the economies realize the dependence of human race on biodiversity and the need for us to build mechanisms mm. to coexist. Because the more we push into natural areas, the more we're going to interact with the, with the wildlife, mm. and the more we're going to get more versions of coronavirus and other related viruses. Indeed. Of course, in the past, we have had other viruses. We have had Marburg, mm. we have had Ebola. All those are viruses that are transmitted through interactions with the wild. Mm. How do we ensure that man balances our coexistence mm. with the nature and tries to avoid this mm. and by working with the communities by working with the government to restore these natural areas and uh, and strengthen mechanisms for their sustainable conservation we are trying mm. to ensure that the globe enhances its resilient capacity mm. against these shocks including mm. viruses and promotes proper coexistence between nature and humans. All right, let's also get the global conservation outlook with Nadia Kanata, the first secretary um, that is a sustainable development section at the European Union. Thank you so much once again for joining us, Nadia. Thank you. Let's talk about the global conservation outlook in that regard. What are the overall EU priorities when it comes to biodiversity and also wildlife conservation? What are those priorities for the EU? Now, I think that there is uh, one key strategy I have to refer to, right. which is the EU Green Deals, which uh, 
uh, is the really the mother of all the strategies that mm -hmm. come in terms of conservation or climate change yeah. environmental protection mm -hmm. I would like to put them together because they are very much interlinked mm -hmm. we cannot look at wildlife without looking at climate change and without uh, looking at yeah. environmental protection so mm -hmm. all need to fall under the same strategy mm -hmm. and with this EU Green Deal what we have really trying to do is to rethink what economic growth mm -hmm. means meaning that okay we realize that our economic growth has depended too much mm. on the misuse of natural uh, resources so we need to find a way mm. to promote innovation technology to fund mm. innovative approaches that allow us to do something that is very simple it's to live in harmony mm. because that's the final objective Indeed. Uh, under this, we have developed in 2020 the strategy for biodiversity. Mm. So it's even more specific in terms of what can be done on biodiversity. Yes, Nadia. And it's very linked to the 10 years restoration plan of the government, that mm. there is a big alignment on the priorities. Mm. And I think that worldwide we all have the same priorities, Indeed. which is mostly to conserve and protect the natural habitats that are already unta uh, still untouched, mm. to restore whatever is possible to promote uh, a development and the growth that allows humans and other species mm. to live together mm. in the same habitat. Mm. And so we have made very strong commitments within our continent mm. and we have said okay those are the commitments we want to achieve because we want to lead by example mm. and then how do we translate them in the way we work both at the global level and with our partner countries like Uganda mm. and at the global level I think it's very important to mention that this is a critical year because it's the year of the convention for biological diversity Indeed. so it's the next 30 years commitments at global level that need to be taken yes Nadia and on this, if I can praise Uganda, because uh, it's the co-chair of all the discussions that are currently ongoing among all the parties so mm. to lead to an mm. agreement. Um, because of COVID, this convention has been postponed. Mm. But uh, normally this year it should take place. And this is where we can say that our interests, Ugandan interests, the global interests meet. Mm. And based on that, we can have an ambitious uh, framework mm. where we can work together. Mm. Well, of course, when we destroy the uh, habitats of the wild species, we are exacerbating climate change. You've cut down the tree, a lion has lost a house, but you've also lost an opportunity to suck all that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And it's going to increase global warming, and there you have it. Extensive rainfall like what we are seeing with the floods in Australia. So paint for us a picture, the correlation between climate change and uh, conservation of wildlife. Uh, it's, it's very linked because mm. it's... Climate change affects the habitats. So it, it's a cycle. Indeed. It's a cycle. Mm. It affects the and the, the habitats are affected by the misuse of natural resources. Mm. So everything goes together. The moment in which uh, the ecosystems suffer and cannot provide the services to the humanity and all other species that they have been providing uh, since the beginning of our planet, mm. then of course the animals are like us. So we suffer, they suffer. Mm. We all have consequences regarding this. So it's impossible to work on one without uh, incorporating uh, the other perspective. Mm. And same if you work on wildlife, you cannot work without thinking about the ecosystems mm. which are under threat. Indeed. So they need to go hand in hand. That is Nadia Kanata, First Secretary at the EU. Um, sustainable Development Section. Thank you so much for that humble submission. Uh, before we let the Honorable State Minister for Tourism go, Honorable, uh, let's talk about uh, what you are doing as a ministry to ensure that all the challenges you highlighted during your preamble are ironed out. Uh, first of all, we are doing uh, a number of issues. Uh, because, you see, we don't only have wildlife within the protected areas. We actually have wildlife even outside the protected areas. Indeed. So you're trying to come up with strategies of seeing how we also manage uh, mm. the wildlife um, mm. outside uh, the protected areas. But secondly, we've also had challenges where we share wildlife with even the neighboring countries. So we've come up with a strategy where we're working together with our partners uh, to make sure that we co-manage, uh, li like, for instance, uh, the Virunga area, <coughs> to see that at least we work as a team and, and, and we come up with policies that work across uh, uh, all the countries. Then, of course, uh, trying to refocus so much on the uh, wildlife uh, education strategy mm. uh, that, of course, it should go back to schools. Uh, it had uh, uh, moved away a little bit. Mm. Growing up, uh, some of us went, most of the schools, I think it would be mandatory mm. for you to take a trip to the zoo, to most of these areas. So there is uh, 
the practical um, kind of feel, not only the the the, the, mm. the theoretical one. So, so I think we are trying to revise that to see how we we we, we re-engage uh, uh, with the Ugandan population from such a, 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 a tender age. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, the other thing that we are trying to do is still uh, create awareness, especially engaging uh, the local leadership, but also trying to see how we we we, we increase on. Uh, because we believe that revenue sharing would be doing because the the first line of protection to wildlife are the communities next to the parks so some money has been going to them over the years but it's been misused so coming up with policies that make sure that once these monies are shared within the communities, the communities feel the impact and therefore there is transformation. Mm. And of course also focusing on training programs uh, with the neighboring communities, to see what they can do to benefit out, mm. of, uh, out of the protected areas mm. in terms of uh, even setting up centers where they can sell crafts. We have a, a specific program mm. suppo supported by our partners mm. where women are trained uh, in crafts making and all this to see how um, community appreciates uh, 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 wildlife, mm. but also, like I said, uh, uh, the law. If mm. you look at the, at at the penalties of, let's say, wildlife trafficking, mm. uh, for instance, if you if, if you are caught trafficking mm. uh, uh, ivory, uh, if you look at uh, the penalty today in 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 in, uh, in 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 our laws in the 2019 mm. Wildlife Act, it is actually punishable. Uh, by 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 a life sentence, so it's uh, as good as uh, probably crime of murder. So so we've come up with the very punitive uh, mm -hmm. actions uh, against whoever participates uh, in all this. But also we've had programs to rehabilitate uh, the poachers themselves, trying to get them out of the parks, uh, educate them, and get them alternative activities. Uh, so that they, they, they probably, we, we thought, uh, or we think that they can be a good channel through which they can actually pull out uh, the rest. And mm -hmm. then we don't, it doesn't have to be punitive, but for them to also appreciate and, uh, and see mm -hmm. uh, how they help us uh, conserve. So yeah, but, but the most uh, area of focus is, is really awareness. And we are doing this uh, through our other partners, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority, Indeed. Uganda Wildlife Education Center, UTB. We have even the private sector. Uh, within the tourism uh, umbrella or the tourism business, uh, all through the associations, the UT, the, the Uganda Tourism Association, mm -hmm. uh, or the, the 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 others that are into uh, what, what do you call it? the two operators, mm -hmm. the, the, all all over the chain to see that we create more awareness and look at conservation mm -hmm. because. We, we cannot discuss one and leave the other. Mm. If, if there are no environments where these animals can live, if the yeah. forests are cut down, then definitely mm. also affecting the wildlife. Indeed. But we are yeah. thinking we should go outside now mm. and also look at the wildlife outside mm. the protected Indeed. areas. If you went to areas like Kalangala and the rest. Mm. So, so, so we are focusing to see that uh, we come up with partnerships, but also to partner more with, with, with our... UNDP with our and the EU and other and stakeholders. The EU and, mm. and the others to see how we come up with... And want to thank them because they have uh, good global strategies and they're also including us as Uganda mm. to see how we put an end to, 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 to you know, this threat to, to, to wildlife but uh, generally to the entire environment. Well, thank you so much, Honorable Bahindu. Can let's also bring in Tom Sengalama. What is the United Nations Development Program doing locally right here within my country, Uganda, to ensure that uh, we increase biodiversity and also conserve wildlife? Yeah, two things. One, let me first throw light on wildlife. Indeed. Normally when we talk about wildlife, the first reflection mm. is wildlife means animals. Indeed. But that's not true. Wildlife means animals, means plants. Fauna and flora. Fra fauna and flora. Indeed. And that's what the day is all about. Mm. Recognizing the importance of fauna and flora, mm. or animals and plants, Indeed. and their interaction, and how that interaction influences the balance mm. in nature, both in terms of building climate resilience, mm. but also in terms of uh, ensuring productivity mm. of our land, of our ecosystems, of our water, our water, and we are looking also at biodiversity in water, biodiversity on land, and how it influences life forms on Earth. Mm. So what are we doing on this? Well, I did talk about our work on wetlands restoration, mm. because we, we, we recognize the importance of wetlands in uh, climate mitigation, and adaptation, but also we recognize it in terms of water purification and other ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. We have, we, we, we recognize that culture mm. is very important in conservation. 
and we have we have organized cultural events. Mm. I am sure you have heard of the Choto Champango that uh, took place yeah. last year in yeah. November. Mm. You have seen uh, UNDP supporting the mountain climbing, mm. where the the head of UTB and uh, and the and celebrities climbed the Mount Ruanzori mm. to go and see for themselves what is there and that was not just for them it mm. was to raise awareness about the importance of biodiversity mm. we are implementing a number of livelihood projects recognizing that you cannot conserve biodiversity mm. amongst poor people people must have options to live in order to respect and protect biodiversity and therefore we are implementing a number of landscape restoration programs mm. we are implementing a number of climate smart agriculture programs including uh, in schools mm. all this is helping us to want to raise awareness about the importance but also to provide alternatives mm. for people to live without depends on, on, mm. on wildlife we have supported wildlife education center uh, to strengthen their education programs uh, particularly focusing on the youth we have supported, we are supporting UWA with the um, aerial, mm -hmm. Adamant aerial vehicles mm -hmm. to do aerial monitoring of wildlife crime and to enhance their conservation mm -hmm. action, including the, uh, 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 including the, uh, I mean, uh, the radio systems mm -hmm. to help them communicate better and coordinate mm -hmm. their conservation action. Mm -hmm. There have been also calls to have many of these people who are engaged in charcoal burning or charcoal production to actually veer to other sources of livelihoods. Uh, have you actually engaged many of these locals to switch to other alternative sources of livelihoods other than charcoal burning that destroys the habitats? Yeah, actually UNDP has been at the center of promoting renewable energy programs Indeed. and clean cooking programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we have supported both solar home systems and also solarization of health units mm -hmm. to ensure that these people have alternative sources of, of um, lighting, but also of cooking. We have partnered with uh, a number of organizations, including GIZ, mm -hmm. to, to, to promote energy saving systems, but also supporting education mm -hmm. on the importance of using some of these mm -hmm. energy saving systems. Mm -hmm. well, when you talk to these locals, what are the, some of the reasons they tell you as to why they are finding it so hard to make that switch from charcoal burning or charcoal usage to renewable energy? Yeah, two, two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, alternative sources of fuel is expensive. All right. Electricity for cooking is sure. I, I mean, it's expensive, mm. but not just electricity for cooking. For cooking, mm. appliances that use electricity are expensive. Indeed. Uh, secondly, most of the communities lack the right awareness, uh, the, the social economics of switching. Some may not even know whether it is expensive or not, mm. but the readily available energy is that. Mm. But the other one is coverage. Only 22%, I think, mm -hmm. of Ugandans access electricity. And in most cases, this electricity may not be reliable. So they find it very difficult to switch to more renewable energy. I see. I so it has more pressure on our forests and more natural pressure habitats. on our forests. Mm -hmm. But also, the other problem is the, the cropping problem of transnational charcoal trade. I see. Okay, some countries have controlled charcoal burning, Uganda has remained a net source of charcoal and we see charcoal trade flourishing in the region coming from Uganda to neighboring countries. Indeed. So I think we also need mm. to use my pronged approach mm. in addressing this. We, we support our communities Indeed. to switch to cleaner energy mm. but also we work with institution, government institutions including NFA All and right. others to strengthen law enforcement and control of charcoal trade. Law enforcement and control of the charcoal trade. I have bad news for you, Tom Sengalama. The police force, some of their members are involved in this charcoal burning illegality. So they are actually abating the practice instead of enforcing the stopping of the same. All right, we are going to continue with, that, with this conversation. Largely after this break, the Honorable Minister will talk to us about tax subsidies for many of these renewable energy equipment and so forth. We'll be right back with this conversation. We still do have Nadia Katana. We still have Tom Sengalama 
Governor and also Honorable Bahinduka is here with us. George will later on join us as the Commissioner of Tourism. We'll be right back. Welcome back and many thanks for staying with us right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Romeo Busuko and of course we are talking about how best we can protect our wildlife and fauna in that regard. I do have uh, wildlife and flora in that regard. I do have um, Honorable Bahinduka Martin. He's with me right here in studio. I also do have George Oyesijere. He is the Commissioner for Wildlife and he's joining us right now on set. He's replacing Tom Sengalama. Also in our midst we do have Nadia Kanata. She is the First Secretary at the EU. Um, that is sustainable development section. Well, George O.S. today, we are talking about some of the avenues we could employ as a country to ensure that uh, we increase biodiversity and also protect our wildlife in that regard. What are some of the recommendations you could have for us this morning? Um, well, thank you very much. Mm. Um, we're a couple of interventions mm. uh, to enhance protection of wildlife. Uh, one is to ensure that uh, we restore degraded habitats, mm. uh, uh, look at areas that have been, uh, uh, forests that have been cut down, for example, uh, look at wetlands that have been degraded and be able to restore mm -hmm. these areas. Um, the other one is, uh, of course, uh, we've been doing uh, strengthened surveillance and art poaching, mm -hmm. but we are looking also at um, implementing measures that revolve around using renewable energy to minimize pressure mm -hmm. on uh, uh, wildlife habitats. You break down those measures, we need them the most. Well, we need a couple of incentives, mm -hmm. to, uh, reduced taxes, for example, mm -hmm. on uh, appliances mm -hmm. for electricity appliances. We need to promote the use of uh, a, a, a gas. Mm -hmm. We need this to use solar. We need to uh, enhance re reduced use of uh, of, of water mm. uh, in, in, in our, for example, in our hospitality uh, facilities, hotels and lodges. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to uh, also uh, sensitize the public about the use of uh, um, energy saving. Uh, appliances like bulbs, for example, mm. so that we minimize on the need and the demand for a natural resource like fuel wood, mm. which which leads to degradation of wildlife habitats. Mm. Yeah. Go ahead, George. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That now the the other measures that we've been implementing, of course, uh, including use of technology. We are uh, looking at the use of drones mm. to enhance the surveillance. To uh, curb poaching. Yes, to curb poaching. But also we've seen uh, uh, in the recent past uh, uh, what we call retaliatory killings, poisoning of some of the key wildlife species mm. such as uh, uh, lions. And this is as a result of uh, uh, lions interfacing with humans and the livestock. So and it's still hard for us to master at that chance for the communities and the animals to coexist together. Yes. It's still a challenge for us. Yes, but uh, uh, government has intervened uh, by uh, initiating a compensation scheme, right. which is provided for in, uh, mm -hmm. in the Wildlife Act 2019. We, we believe that once people are compensated for losses mm -hmm. occasioned by wildlife, they will be able to, uh, to, to respect the animals and also we have uh, started implementing other measures like fencing, electric fencing, solar power defencing to protect the elephants that are also endangered. We feel uh, we could also do a lot of um, awareness. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are strengthening that section. We have a van that moves around these days sensitizing the public. Uh, we continue to also do what we call benefit sharing arrangements. We think communities and, and, and local people can appreciate the value of wildlife if they benefit from this wildlife. It's not about protection and protection and mm -hmm. protection. We needed to see some benefits accruing from this mm -hmm. wildlife. So We are getting reports that they are even doing some kind of controlled farming yes. within these settlements. Yes, uh, we have uh, uh, controlled uh, breeding. Mm -hmm. uh, the law allows uh, regulated 
access to some of these resources, Indeed. you breed, you market, and you export. Mm -hmm. we, what we are discouraging is the direct capture from the wild, mm -hmm. and then you export. That is not allowed. Uh, what we allow is uh, farming. We've developed guidelines. Uh, they are available at the Uganda Wildlife Authority for farming. But you can also ranch the way we ranch livestock. You can uh, establish a farm and you ranch these animals and you trade locally or export. Mm. Yes, and that reduces pressure on the wild stock, but also it creates incentives and benefits for people who are involved and now they, they are able to. To protect these animals. Indeed. Thank you, George Oyes. Today he is the Commissioner for Wildlife at the Tourism Ministry. Let's also bring in um, uh, Nadia Kanati, First Secretary at the EU's Sustainable Development Section. Nadia, how can our government here in Uganda, together with the EU, work together to promote biodiversity and also wildlife conservation at a global stage? Uh, at the global stage, mm. it's very much to continue our uh, partnership and our dialogue to push for same priorities. I see. Uh, this we have been having a demarche very recently mm. together with the, the Prime Minister, the State Minister mm. for Tourism, the State Minister for mm. Environment, because let's remind that it's a cross-sectoral approach that we need here. So we are really aligning as much as possible what we want to push for mm. at the global level. Then it's very important to see what we can do together in Uganda, you know, where the EU funding can mm. support the best, mm. the priorities of the government. And if you allow me, I'd like to give just one example, which is the forestry sector, because I think it's important. It's mm. related to climate change, to value chains. Uh, it's related to, to wildlife Indeed. that live in the forest. Mm. So I think it's a good example. And we have been working for 30 years with the government, but it's true that the last 15, we focused on commercial. Mm forestry so which is very very important and now we have decided together with the government to really go much more uh, holistic meaning that we said okay it's very important we continue to work on value chain development but it's also very important that we join hands to fund specifically mm. interventions on conservation Mm. for example, of protected area, restoration of protected area, mm. connecting a protected area like wildlife corridors, which are essential for the survival of the species. Um, to work more together on governance issues. You know, how can we s uh, help you to strengthen the, your uh, data management mm. of uh, species, of forests, of trees, of... Uh, how many gorillas, how many coastal cranes do we have? Do we uh, have the how data? How many type of trees? Mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, mm. So, you know, to really partner more to, to say, okay, the problem cannot be tackled from one entry point. Indeed. It has to be tackled from we need data to plan. And I think we need to go back to the importance of livelihoods. Yes, no idea. Because especially the communities living around the forest, because mm. now I'm talking about the example of forest, mm. uh, need to find the best livelihoods for them that allow them to live in harmony and not to harm the forest. And mm. for example, um, we are really discussing on how to do more on agroforestry, for example, mm. on, or how to best use private lands. A lot of deforestation in Uganda in the last decades took mm. place on private lands. I see. How do you best use them in order mm. to grow again? Do you go through trees or uh, do you promote issues like payment for ecosystem services mm. uh, where uh, mm. owners of lands decide to protect them mm. instead of cut them but they have an income coming from that. So there are really many, many things that can be done together. Mm. Eh? On this, uh, in, in, in the area. last uh, 30 years of the EU liaising with my country in, the sp in this sphere, have you noticed any gaps when it comes to the promotion of biodiversity and also um, what we're talking about, wildlife conservation? Gaps. Now, I think that a lot has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, what probably we need to do more mm -hmm. is to have to build an approach that goes beyond projects. I see. And on this, I think, again, if you allow me to take the example really of important. Go on forestry, mm. is that we have decided uh, with the government not to do only a project, mm. but to come up with a partnership. It's non-binding, it's not a contract, it's not an international mm. agreement, but it's a document where we say, okay, those are your priorities, this is how we can have a dialogue mm. and structure dialogue on those, so that nothing is left uh, unattended. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there are some important issues that when you have only a project approach, mm -hmm. you leave out mm -hmm. and you realize it at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. Here is to bring together the two much more. Mm -hmm. and, and like this, you have much less the risk of leaving anything 
outside mm. than by looking only from uh, from yes a project approach a point of view mm. then uh, uh, there is potential uh, more than gaps in for example Uganda has tremendously developed its tourism sector in the last uh, in the last 20 years it's incredible what has mm. happened and and on there how to develop much more ecotourism you know how to bring that component in it how to work with communities to work with hotel uh, owners to work with uh, tour operators so that they are fully involved and as a result, there is a protection of the wildlife, mm -hmm. especially in natural parks, mm. because they are part of it. So this is an area where, for example, uh, we have not worked enough, I think, and we want to do much more with the government and the private sector, because they are, of course, in the front line mm. in terms of investing in, uh, in ecotourism. Indeed. All right. Honorable Bahindu, let's talk about success stories. We've been talking about the challenges since we began this show, but what are some of those success stories you can verifiably boast of as a ministry when it comes to promotion of biodiversity and wildlife conservation? Honorable. Uh, well, <coughs> quite a number. I don't mm. think I'd have time to finish them uh, right <laughs> now. At least you'd have had highlighted some of them. Yeah, and of course, uh, still the challenges are there, mm. and, and we are still tackling those. And, and like she was saying, that uh, <coughs> also to create awareness for Ugandans to, to, to have a culture of travel, move to most of these protected areas, mm. so they can get the fuel. And the numbers are improving. Mm. So we believe maybe over a period of five years it will be better. When you have a certain section of Ugandans understand this by visiting these very protected areas and getting to meet these species and understand <coughs> what we're actually talking about, I think it will help us uh, uh, going forward as, as a sector. So, so there's a lot uh, that we're doing. We had a few challenges because of COVID, uh, a little bit of setback because uh, there was hardly travel uh, going on, but the sector was doing well. Like I told you, bringing in uh, a lot of revenue, employing a number of people across the sector. Uh, and, and actually, you know, because it's intellect. Mm. Right from the, 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 the lowest person at the chain, the farmer that will get to sell food to a hotel owner, you know, so, so, so everyone benefits in a, in, a, in a way or the other. Mm -hmm. And we still believe the sector has potential. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, all statistics show it's the fastest growing sector in this country, but even globally. So we want to tap into that uh, market aggressively. We recently launched uh, a brand repositioning uh, Uganda as the best destination to visit uh, in the next uh, maybe decade, uh, also many years to come. A and we think when we market this aggressively, we shall have more people coming to this country, bring in some revenue for us, but also encourage the very Ugandan uh, to, to visit, be patriotic, and get the feel of uh, uh, what the power of Africa is. But also, <coughs> uh, I would say, uh, generally, because it's one of the drivers that that have uh, probably escalated the uh, degradation and all this mm. is because of the poverty within within the country mm. but government has taken deliberate measures uh, recently they launched the forest development model and I believe, mm. yeah and i believe it will be a good strategy enhancing people's incomes so they can look at alternatives when they have capacity to probably uh, use the other fuels that we're talking about then i think it's uh, it's easier so there's also a deliberate move by government uh, to make sure that there is some good income in, in, in people's pockets. Mm. Because, for instance, <coughs> in some of the communities where we come from, the reason why people go poaching, you see, when someone uh, kills, uh, let's say, a small antelope, in, in some of the areas I know he will sell it maybe for 200,000, 300,000, but take the risk of being killed by maybe a wild animal in the park and all that, just because he wants to put some small money uh, in their pocket. So we believe that these deliberate uh, measures by government mm. to tackle poverty, mm. and I know the numbers have improved over the years, and I believe they will get better. They it will be a general solution that will probably uh, help us uh, improve our ecosystems but also look at uh, conserving the environment. Uh, Thank you very much, Honorable. Mm -hmm. Mr. George OESG, let's talk about the $64,000 question. COVID 19, let's talk about how it has affected the measures that have been put in place to actually ensure that we promote bio biodiversity and also wildlife conservation. How did the pandemic affect all those plans, those measures that had been put in place, and also climate change? How did it affect those uh, efforts? efforts to actually promote biodiversity and uh, conserve wildlife? Um, we observed mm. a decline in tourism performance. Mm. Now, over 90% of our funding for conservation, biodiversity conservation, comes from tourism. Mm. So we saw a decline from um, over 1.6 billion US dollars to about 500,000 US dollars. Wow. 
2020. That is heinous. That was uh, a, a quite uh, significant uh, decline, mm -hmm. and that affects now our operations because we get the money and re-inject it mm -hmm. into uh, conservation programs. Mm -hmm. uh, around the, the time we experienced uh, uh, the lockdowns, the mm -hmm. first lockdown, we also observed some increased poaching mm -hmm. because people were redundant, people were at home, people were not working, so they were straying into the parks to look for food, to look for animals, but that has been uh, uh, gradually contained. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an impact of, of, of COVID on, on, on wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. We also saw, of course, a, a decline in revenue sharing funds because we give out 20% of park entrance fees to the communities. Now the tourists were no longer coming and that creates a problem because they, uh, you need to manage the expectations mm. of the communities. They, ex they want their money but the tourists are not coming and we can't explain. So that was an, an effect o o of COVID but also restricted the travel and, and, and then also the, the health aspect. Mm. We needed to monitor ex in intensively mm. the health of the communities but also of the animals because this COVID mm. could affect the animals. Mm. Uh, so those were some of the effects. Mm. Um, you asked about climate change. There is also the issue of climate change. Yes, yes, climate change. Do you believe we can be successful when it comes to protecting our natural habitats vis-a-vis -vis wildlife minus handling the issue of climate change? Remember, it could be a farmer. Yes, I climate. did till my land, rains came and they took everything away. Yes. I'm going to be forced to look somewhere else, maybe a natural habitat, maybe a forest somewhere to go and do my farming. And if I do not have food at home to eat because the rains took away everything, I'm going to look at the wild animals for food. So if we do not protect our people from the vulnerabilities brought about by climate change, they're going to be forced to go back to the natural habitats, kill the wild animals for survival. What is being done about that? Well, well, thank you. Well, first let me I will try in a couple of uh, uh, mm. effects or impacts. Yes, One, sir. of course, we've seen uh, floods. Mm. Uh, not only displacing our people mm -hmm. but also and the landslides okay. but also destroying the wildlife habitats mm -hmm. because when the floods come in and the landslides they destroy the forests mm -hmm. and, and the other habitats but we've seen also changes in the the, the vegetation the composition mm -hmm. the climate change tends to favor the growth of certain species and they multiply very easily and then they affect the quality of the habitat but also the quality of the food for the animals. Mm -hmm. Now the animals are forced to move out of their gazetted areas to go and look for food elsewhere where they end up conflicting with, with our people. Mm -hmm. We've also seen, uh, I'll tell you what I've observed around the Chibare forest. Uh, and this is a, a, a published scientific paper mm -hmm. that uh, uh, climate change has affected the fruiting patterns of some tree species that are used by mm -hmm. the chimpanzees and other monkeys. Now, uh, around some seasons, there are no fruits in, uh, in the forest, and the chimpanzees have to go out mm -hmm. to look for sugarcane, and that creates a problem. So uh, what have we done? We have um, uh, continued to sensitize the people. We are uh, promoting uh, crops that are not largely affected by the animals so that you minimize on the conflict mm. we continue to promote research on the impacts but also what we are doing aggressively is restoring these habitats by trying to uproot mm. these plants mm. that are favored by the changes that occur because of the, the variations mm. in, in, in climate uh, so some of those interventions we have a program uh, that we call it an invasive species eradication program. We are focusing on uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park to restore the habitat so that we keep the animals mm. inside mm. the protected areas. And with that, gentlemen and lady, we've come to the end of this conversation. Largely, we've run out of time. It's around two Two to three minutes after a midday in that regard. We, should, we shall soon be getting ready for NTV at one. But for this conversation, thank you very much, Honorable Bahinduka Martin. Thank you very much, George Oyesijire and Nadia Kanata. Many thanks for having made the time to speak to us. Kind regards to the uh, people at the EU.
Thank Indeed. <laughs> All right. And that's it for this conversation. We're largely talking about uh, recovering key species for the restoration of our ecosystem. Recovering key species for the restoration of the ecosystem ahead of Wild, Wild Wildlife Day. That is tomorrow on the 3rd of March. My name is Romeo Busiku. Please protect the environment, protect the fauna, protect the flora for the betterment of our world and the communities. Good morning. Good afternoon.